are in listen-only mode. Hello, uh, this is Brad Adams. Thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for this cost reporting webinar. Uh, I get the pleasure of introducing uh, our speakers today. They are both from uh, Kraft Healthcare Consulting, and they are a gold level sponsor of the Tennessee chapter. Uh, first up, we've got Scott Murty, and Scott leads the Kraft Healthcare Consulting practice. Um, he has got over 20 years of healthcare experience with reimbursement, operational and financial issues. Um, he typically will consult with various areas, obviously involving reimbursement, um, Medicare and Medicaid cost reports, which is the focus here um, today, and they have got clients throughout the U.S. Also joining him is a new member to his team, uh, Jonathan Utz. Jonathan is a manager with Kraft Healthcare Consulting Practice. He's got over 15 years of healthcare industry experience and specializes in hospital operations and other third-party reimbursement issues for hospitals and healthcare facilities, as well as experience with cost reports. Um, so if there is anybody out there who is, who's got this up on like a common screen with multiple people around, if you can just tell us who all's there, um, either in the questions or the chat function, that'll help me and, and Kelly Miller, who's on here with me, also helping to, to keep track of things um, for reporting our education hours. Um, for the chapter, and if you need the handouts, those are also available on the Tennessee HFMA website, tnhfma.org, um, and just look on the sidebar there um, for recent blog posts, and you'll see one about this webinar. And we have also got uh, another webinar coming up that is posted on the website that you can register for in March. So without further ado, I will turn this over um, to Scott and Jonathan, and thank you, gentlemen. All right, and thank you, Brad. We appreciate everyone uh, attending today and listening in on this uh, cost report webinar. Uh, the main focus today is really just to discuss and understand some of the underlying concepts um, that truly affect the settlement areas of the uh, cost report, which ultimately affect reimbursement either indirectly or directly. The assumption is that most of the people listening today have some familiar, familiarity with um, Medicare cost reports. Either they um, uh, use them in the organization or uh, prepare them for the organization or for clients. So have a, a, a fairly decent understanding. And looking through the attendee list, it, it does appear we got some people that you know definitely have uh, you know well advanced cost reporting knowledge and some folks that probably don't have uh, very much at all. So we're going to try and keep it somewhere in between. Um, but this webinar is definitely not to learn how to prepare a cost report as much as it is to uh, make sure we understand some of the important areas that truly affect uh, reimbursement, again, either directly or indirectly. Uh, the main areas that we're going to focus on are uh, going to be, first, we're going to look at uh, wage index and uh, worksheet S10, which reports the uncompensated care. And these are truly areas that indirectly affect reimbursement. There's not going to be a settlement on the cost report related to these areas. Next area is going to be the, uh, the cost to charge ratios, which essentially is going to take us from cost finding all the way to matching um, uh, the, the cost to the charges. Uh, to obtain cost of charge ratios. And for most prospective pay hospitals, this, again, is going to be an indirect um, reimbursement impact where it's, it's, you're truly not going to have a settlement on the cost report. However, it does impact future rates. Uh, but there are other types of providers where this does have a direct impact, uh, such as the critical access hospital. The, uh, the cost charge ratios are crucial in coming up with those settlements. And from there, we're going to get in the areas that uh, uh, really you know, directly impact settlement on the, the cost report. That's going to be disproportionate share and Medicare bad debts, um, which you know, disproportionate share, every PPS hospital can uh, certainly, uh, or I say med, PPS med search hospital can certainly qualify for DISH. Not all of them get disproportionate share reimbursement. Medicare bad debts, every Part A provider out there can uh, uh, report Medicare bad debts and get reimbursement for those. And then we have the um, IME and GME, which these are for uh, interns and resident programs. 
uh, in looking at most of the people that are registered. Done up here, we have uh, really any hospitals outside of Vanderbilt that have a, a teaching program. Um, but there are certainly areas to, that are important to look out for um, involving interns residents that uh, do affect reimbursement on the cost report. As well as we'll look at uh, uh, organ acquisitions and um, uh, where we're you know, transplanting organs and having organs put in. That's also another direct impact on the cost report that 99% of the, the folks in Tennessee uh, that are logged on today, really it's not going to impact providers that they're working with. But we will kind of touch on both IME and GME in the organ acquisitions and just show the important areas that do affect reimbursement there. Getting started, uh, let's talk about the wage index a little bit. And those that have uh, been involved in preparing cost reports, you all know this is the section. It's Worksheet S3 Part 2 and Worksheet S3 Part 3. At the front of the cost report, it's a lot of salary and paid hours information and benefits. And, and I kind of wonder why in the world do we all put this down on there because it really doesn't affect reimbursement. Um, however, it does indirectly affect future reimbursement. And uh, you know, for, for one particular area, um, for medical surgical hospitals and SNFs, skilled nursing facilities, on their cost reports, they report their wage index. It's actually reported separately. So you have a hospital wage index, and then for skilled nursing facilities, they have their own wage index, but this data gets compiled for every facility across the country and it ultimately gets the, the CMS compiles that data and uh, it's, it's compiled and it's used to, to weight future payments uh, determining on your geographic area of the United States. Uh, for instance, in where uh, I'm at, Nashville, Tennessee, our wage index is very different than uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, or New, New York uh, City in New York, or San Francisco, California. And the reason for this is ultimately it's the, the cost of staffing. And this is what is, is being tracked and what it's costing to um, uh, staff your hospital or your nursing home. And then um, ultimately, and this compiles always a couple uh, years in arrears when this data is compiled. But that's what's used to weight, as you see in your DRG calculations, your APC or rug rates, et cetera, um, how that is weighted for the, the wage portion of that payment rate. And um, another important area that the wage index is used for is geographic reclassifications. And those of you that are not aware, this is where a hospital, for instance, that is in a rural area um, and gets a state rural rate, which typically is quite a bit lower than a urban CBSA payment rate, uh, again, because the, the typical uh, theology behind that is the cost of staffing is less in a rural area than an urban area. However, there's uh, uh, certain things that can be done to classify a rural hospital and have them geographically reclassified into an urban area uh, in, in turn get a higher payment rate. And this can be you know, huge for uh, a hospital and ultimately it can be you know, millions of dollars a year as an add-on to their, uh, their payment rates. Um, some of the main areas of focus, if you have the, uh, um, the, you, your handouts printed out, I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between slide four and slide five. But essentially, um, on slide four, I'm going to kind of highlight a couple key areas. And slide five is a snapshot of a cost report. And some of the cost reports, just as a preface, that we've used uh, in this uh, presentation are, of course, it's, it's a dummy hospital. Um, but you know, we try to keep the data very basic. Um, and not convoluted where we have a lot of sub-providers and a lot of other things involved that is just going to kind of make the, the data more confusing to look at. Um, then looking here at slide five, um, which is the, the top part of Worksheet S3 Part 2, um, line one is ultimately where your uh, wages are reported. Your, this is your, your, your gross salary number. 
um, and that flows from the, the salary and other cost data that's input in, in worksheet A. Um, and then if you look at column five, that is ultimately where the uh, paid hours are put in associated with uh, those salaries. And then uh, in column six is the base average hourly wage prior to any adjustments, and in this scenario it's $25.88. Now, this particular example that we're using is a teaching hospital, so there are certain things that need to be considered. And um, again, this is very basic data, but line seven, we're including the salaries for the interns and residents and related hours, and ultimately get an hourly, average hourly wage associated with that. As you can see, that is a pretty low average hourly wage, which some of you that are not involved with teaching facilities may not realize that interns and residents do not make a lot of money. Um, they uh, save that for once they get, get out and, and then they get paid the big bucks. Um, some other areas to, to look for when uh, entering your hours is make sure to know your payroll system. Um, those hours typically are reported, or your salaries are typically reported off what's posted to the general ledger. Um, as always, Medicare requires you use an accrual basis of accounting, so those salaries have, um, you know, accruals from beginning of the year back and out, and accruals at the end of the year, depending on when the pay period is. It's very important to make sure your hours tie to those salaries. Payroll systems generally, you know, they're going to spit out what the true paid hours were for the time or the pay periods during that year, and not necessarily related to the pay period cutoffs and what was accrued. So just make sure that's considered. Uh, larger facilities can be very minimal impact. Smaller facilities, it, it can make a difference. Um, also, make sure when reporting those salaries um, that you look at, and I'm kind of flipping over to slide six here, you make sure your shift dis differentials, your weekend holiday pay, uh, callback hours, all that is reported appropriately. Um, and those instructions are, a, you know, they're listed on CMS website. They're also part of the most cost reporting software. But ultimately, if that is not reported uh, appropriately when Medicare comes in and audits the wage index, which is always a separate audit from when they're auditing the rest of the cost report, they review that wage index, and these are things that they're looking for. Um, a couple other things to look for talking back to, to line five that I just want to point out is, or slide five, lines one through ten, this is everything that is actually on your hospitals or nursing homes, but in this case hospitals, um, financial statements. These are the the um, the salaries and hours related to everyone that, that's paid and reported on your financials. And uh, you know, if you have doctors on staff, they're going to be there reported on lines 4 and 4.01. And as I mentioned, the teaching. But as you go down, you look at, at lines 8, 9, and 10. If you have or affiliated with a home office, and you have home office personnel that are on your payroll, on the hospital's payroll, not the home office. However, they have duties that are related to other facilities. That needs those salaries and related hours need to be reported there on line eight because ultimately those are being backed out, and in theory, then they would be included on the home office cost report and then reallocated back into the hospital's report, uh, and we'll get to that here in a few minutes. Another um, point to look at is the wage index for the hospitals does not include um, excluded areas; it's just truly the medical surgical areas of the hospital. So line nine is this, is uh, related to a SNF, if this hospital ha has a SNF, as well as other sub-providers in line 10, which are going to be if it has a psych unit or a rehab unit or an LTAC or other any other excluded unit, such as, uh, or excluded providers such as the home health agency. All of that data gets backed out. So it's just the hospital's wage index, the medical surgical portion that's being reported here. Um, another important thing uh, to point out is when you're reporting those interns and residents, um, you want to report the exact 
FTEs related to the time they're working, not just a salaried FTE. Um, it's got to be exact, and this does impact um, your intern resident reimbursement, that, that IME reimbursement. Um, and we'll talk about, about that a little later, but it's a, it's, a, it's a rolling average of these FTEs. And if that's not reported appropriately in flowing through the cost report, um, that can uh, and will impact reimbursement. Um, other areas to look at, I'm on slide seven now, is um, your contract labor. And so this is um, basically essentially contract labor related to patient care. This is on line 11. It does not include um, contract for administrative services or like such as billing or collections or housekeeper or anything like that. This is going to be if you have contracted physical therapy or contracted nursing, et cetera. All that is going to be reported there, and that does get added into your wage index. And um, line 14 there, uh, you'll notice where it says home office salaries coming in. In this particular example, uh, there's 708,000 of uh, salaries and wages, and that does include benefits coming from the home office uh, in associated uh, uh, hours. Um, as I mentioned before, on line eight, those are home office personnel that are on the hospital's trial balance that need to come out if appropriate. Um, line 14 is those home office coming in um, if you are a facility that is associated with the home office. Important to note the difference. Um, sometimes it's not a, a, an impact like in this particular example. There weren't any home office salaries to come out. Um, but a lot of times there, there are, and that needs to be treated appropriately. Um, another thing for the contract labor is you know, certainly make sure that um, the hours that are being reported are coming off the, the invoices, and that is tracked when your uh, contract labor invoices the hospital. Um, this is one thing that we're noticing in wage index audits that uh, Medicare is coming back and really wanting support for those hours associated with the contract labor. Generally, yeah, that's, that's a much higher dollar amount. If you look in this example, the average hourly wage on line 11 is $50.28, which is much higher than typically if they just were paying them on salary. So that is something that is certainly looked at. As we go to slide eight, we're um, looking at benefits um, on Slides eight and nine, we have what we refer to as core benefits, and then we have um, other costs. And the core benefits, easily put, are the benefits related to the, the salaries for the medical surgical hospital. As you go down, you see these other lines. These are going to be the benefits related to the items that were noted above in uh, those first lines, where if there, it's a teaching hospital, um, if there are other um, uh, items we'll call excluded areas, so benefits for a psych unit or home health agency, et cetera. All those benefits are being backed out. And you can see on line 25 in this example, uh, there are benefits related to the interns and residents that were noted above. Slides 10 and 11 get down to really looking at the overhead costs. Uh, that are reported. And these overhead costs are ultimately going to be your administrative and general costs, so business office, accounting, um, collections, registration, et cetera, as well as uh, other overhead areas, which are laundry and linen, housekeeping, your operation of plant, dietary, nursing administration. Um, and they're all reported on lines 26 down through lines 43. Um, and again, these are the salaries that are reported on Worksheet A when um, the salaries and other costs are from your trial balance or input by department. These salaries flow over, and then you're entering the, the uh, hours associated with those salaries. And again, the same thing, make sure any accruals are, are considered and that your hours are apples to apples with the salaries. And also, you see there in the middle, and the column is not noted, but it, it would be the third column with 
numbers where it's, there's the on line 27, you note there's $13,916. That's actually looking at a reclassification, which comes off worksheet A6 of the cost report. And you want to make sure when salaries are being reclassified that those hours that are input in that last column do reflect the reclassified salaries. You're not reporting hours that don't reflect the reclassification. Otherwise, it's going to skew your average hourly wage. Another th important thing to look at is always compare your average hourly wages uh, for these departments as well as overall with your prior year cost report. That is something that CMS is going to do the first thing when they get this report. They're going to look, and if there's a significant change in that aver average hourly wage, they're going to go back to the provider and want to know why. Uh, so if there is a change and it's justified, be prepared to answer that. And it, doesn't hurt to include that in your, your notes to the cost report when being submitted. And just a sideline on that, we find out we prepare a lot of cost reports for clients every year. And when we go through and we get the wage index audit, which is generally you know, a couple years after the cost report's been filed, those auditors that are reviewing the wage index are different than the people that accept it and are reviewing the cost report for, for the settlement. And a lot of times, those cost report work papers do not make it back to the wage index auditors. It can be very frustrating when the fiscal intermediary asks you for data that you've already sent and sent with the cost report or sent again as a follow-up when there were proposed adjustments made um, in the cost report settlement. Uh, settlement. Just an FYI, and those of you that are involved in this area, I'm sure you see that and get frustrated as well. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to include two sets of work papers for the wage index, one that really gets filed with the cost report, another one that's clearly marked for wage index only. Now, it's a lot more work, but it can save time and headaches a little later. Slide 12 is really a summary of worksheet S3 part 3. And, and I'm not going to go through each item there, but ultimately it's just showing um, the, again, the, the hospitals total salaries and hours and their average hourly wage. That's coming through those items that we backed out, coming down to where you can see the, the true medical surgical portion of the average hourly wage, which ultimately gets used for um, um, uh, weighting those, um, the, the DRGs and the APCs and all that in future periods. Um, so it's always, ultimately, this is what you want to look at and compare and make sure that uh, it passes the smell test uh, when you look at those average, average hourly wages. From there, we're going to talk briefly about worksheet S10 in uncompensated care. I'm going to let Jonathan talk about that area. All right. So <clears throat> worksheet S10 has been around for a few years. And you know, historically, we kind of just glossed over it. It really didn't have uh, any kind of reimbursement impact. Uh, but that has changed now. Um, according to Obamacare, they're now going to be using this uh, on a, to allocate your disproportionate share payments. So the importance of reporting this uh, uncompensated care has obviously uh, increased dramatically, um, which Scott is going to talk about more in, in just a few moments on the uh, dish, dish impact. Um, one of the things, you know, when you're identifying your uh, charity care, you want to make sure that this doesn't include any discounts or courtesy allowances. Um, these charges, you know, have to meet your charity care policy. If they don't, they shouldn't be included in this total. As I mentioned, this is going to impact future uh, payments, which also is going to include your health information technology funding, and it's also going to be part of your Medicare uh, fraction, the denominator. A calculation. Um, you know, one thing with uh, you know non-profit hospitals, they're, they're required to report this on their 990 tax form. This is not what this uh, worksheet represents. So don't get those two confused. Turn to uh, slide 15. Determining your charity care policy. As I mentioned before, this has to follow your specific policy. You know. Historically, obviously, they haven't audited this, but you can, you know, rest assured that since this is going to be used to calculate your dish payments, 
they're probably going to come back, you know, in future years and audit this. And you're going to make sure that you're following your charity care policy. Otherwise, this could have a negative impact on your dish. Um, you know, one of the couple of the guidelines, you know, has to follow the federal federal poverty limit guidelines. These were published on the 23rd of January of this year. And there's a link within our uh, or document there that you can link to and uh, check those guidelines out. Um, all right, so if you flip to the next next chart, you can see the specific lines, um, and I won't go into detail. It's pretty self-explanatory, but you know it breaks out your charity, Medicaid revenues, um, and if you're in a state, I know Tennessee, we we order a lot of different states, and you might have Alabama Medicaid coming in or Georgia, Kentucky. You need to include all your Medicaid revenues on this uh, worksheet, not just uh, TenCare. All right. So on the next few slides, it's just going over the specific line items for uh, each input. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, if we go to slide 19. There's some, you know, I want to warn you on a couple of these, and one is line 21. It, uh, again, I'm on slide 19, and this calculation uses your cost to charge ratio. Now, again, unless you're cost based, your critical access, you know, cost to charge ratio really doesn't impact you unless you have a lot of outliers coming through your facility. Um, this is changing uh, in the future, and Scott's going to get in more detail on that. So, uh, just make take a mental note to make sure that uh, you come back to that because that's going to impact this spreadsheet as well. Um, another item to note is uh, line 26, your bad debt expense. That must be net of any recoveries. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott on the cost to charge ratios. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Cost to charge ratios, this is really an area that I, I really enjoy and like to see. It's really kind of the, the guts of the cost report, if you will, uh, going through all cost findings. And uh, I know there's some folks on this call from uh, when I saw the attendee list, and I won't point out any names, they've been around as long as I have, or if not longer. And they remember when everything was cost-based. Um, and so anything, any little tweak to an expense or a charge or to a reclassification or adjustment or to a statistic ultimately affected reimbursement. Nowadays, as we have gone to, for the most part, a prospective pay payment system, we really don't see that direct impact as we make these changes. And uh, a lot of times you wonder, really, what difference does it make if I'm only getting reimbursed on DISH and Medicare bad debts for a typical PPS hospital? Why do I even care about this? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how there are these indirect impacts of not um, reporting this information appropriately. Um, another reason it's important is just it's a federal mandate that every hospital has to do it. Um, or you get your payments cut off. And I know nobody wants to do that. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole process of cost finding. Again, that's really not the scope of this presentation. But I am going to really, you know, briefly look at our worksheet A here. And this example, and this is a very basic data from a uh, generic surgical hospital. I'm not picking up a lot of other data and a lot of other cost centers to, to convolute here. But you're, you're reporting the information from your trial balance on columns one and two. And I'm looking at slide 21. Um, column four is going to be any reclassifications that are made. And the reason why we do these reclassifications is to make sure that we are truly matching cost to charges. We want to reclassify any costs to make sure that it is going to the appropriate revenue producing department ultimately after we do our uh, step down. Um, so we're truly matching the costs related to a particular area to the uh, charges that is represented. 
The lines 1 through 16 here is essentially the overhead costs. And again, these are those same overhead departments that I mentioned on the wage index. And those salaries reflected there flow automatically and on the wage index, and that's where you put your hours in. Um, column 6 represents your adjustments, and that's where you're removing non-allowable costs. Column 7 is your net expense, or really your allowable costs. Um, slide 22, we're moving down from the overhead costs, and we're looking at the true uh, guts of the hospital, if no pun intended. But this is really the revenue producing areas. Um, line 30 is where your uh, services uh, for your adult and pediatrics. This is the true medical surgical line. These are the, the costs related to that patient being in an in a inpatient bed. Um, if there was a subprovider or a SNF, they would be reported down below that. Lines 50 down to 73 are all of the ancillary charges. These are going to be your, or I'm sorry, ancillary departments and the costs related to them. And that goes from the OR down to all your radiology departments and supplies and, and drugs. Note on line 72 that implants have been broken out from your chargeable supplies. This is something new that CMS did on the, on the cost reporting forms last year. And it's a very important uh, piece to the cost report as for outpatient, uh, when it's not necessarily outpatient, but for um, uh, what we see a lot in surgeries is where you have high cost outliers for implants and devices. Those items cost a lot more to provide that service. And if you break those out and get a true cost to charge ratio that's not being deflated by your other supplies, it um, ultimately can uh, help with those outlier um, re or set or reimbursements, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Um, the other parts of worksheet A, again, are just other areas uh, up top, other outpatient areas such as emergency room uh, observation, and we come down to uh, non-reversible cost centers, which is lines 192 and below. And these are areas that your, the facility is not getting reimbursed uh, by Medicare or Medicaid for. Um, then we get into our overhead um, alloc allocations. And this is worksheet B1. And again, I'm not going to get into the detail of these allocations. Um, assume that most people have kind of gone through this process. But it is important to make sure that your statistics used um, for these uh, overhead allocations are up to date and they are maintained. Uh, time studies need to be maintained. Uh, if your stats are, are using FTEs or meal counts, there's a variety of different stats. One of the big ones that we all use is square footage. Make sure that is maintained. Things get shifted around every year. Um, what was once a cleaning closet is now a of a pharmacy closet. That makes a difference on how it's reported on the cost report. If it happened mid-year, that square footage needs to be weighted. These are all important areas to make sure that are con they're considered when we go through cost finding. Now, once we have gotten through cost finding, um, and this slide 25 is really just to kind of compare before and after. Um, the first column there is from Worksheet A, Column 7, which is your allowable costs for these revenue-producing departments. And that's essentially straight off the trial balance after reclassifications and adjustments. Now, the, the far column to the right comes off of Worksheet B, Part 1, in the last column, Column 26. And that is that same cost. However, the overhead allocations have been added to it. So as you see for line 30 for your adults and peds, it had 835,000 of what we refer to as direct costs. However, the overhead costs after being allocated, that's your administrative in general, your housekeeping, operation of the plant, medical records, et cetera, that came out to 1.6 million. So it essentially doubled the cost for that department. And the, the thing to point out here is, again, uh, worksheet A, column 7 is your direct costs direct allowable costs, we see B part 1, column 26, is your direct plus your indirect. Now, as we go to worksheet C, 
And as I mentioned before, this all starts with worksheet A and it ends with worksheet C, and that's my attempt in accounting humor to be funny. But uh, um, one thing that's very important to note is worksheet C is your hospital's gross charges. And that's not net charges. These are the gross charges that are, are coming off your uh, P&L. Make sure when that data is entered that it con you consider any revenue reclassifications. Your revenues need to be grouped to your using your Medicare revenue codes, not your GL codes. 99% of the hospitals, when revenues get booked to their GL, it's going by um, department or general ledger department which is fine for reporting purposes um, on your financial statements as well as good operational tools you can determine where those costs are. However, when we come out through this cost finding to come to a Medicare and or a Medicaid settlement, uh, we're really looking at the costs associated with those revenue uh, centers in relation to the Medicare revenue codes, which don't always match up to um, where the general ledger is. And a perfect example is chargeable supplies. And I mentioned implants earlier um, and, it's, and why those are broken out from chargeable supplies. But nine times out of ten, a hospital, when they have an operating room and an active, uh, do active surgeries there, those supply charges are posted to the general ledger to the operating room department. Um, however, the chargeable supplies need to be reclassified to their own cost center. And again, that's the cost as well as the revenues. And a lot of times we don't see that. And in worksheet C of the cost report, there's not an area to physically reclassify revenues like there is worksheet A6 on the expense. That needs to be done prior to input. And ultimately, once you do that, you're able to get your revenues um, uh, compare apples to apples from worksheet C to your uh, program revenues, whether it be Medicare or Medicaid. Um, also, it's important to note, are there any adjustments to the revenues, to your gross revenues that are reported on worksheet C that need to be removed? And a perfect example of that is professional fees. If a uh, hospital is billing pro fees and they're getting reimbursed on a fee schedule, then they don't need to be reported on worksheet C. One last note I will uh, put here is it is extremely important to maintain your charge master and this is ultimately where those gross charges are coming from and a lot of times the person maintaining the charge master is not the person preparing the cost report and it's not the CFO or controller of the facility either and the charge master can get out of whack those charges need to be for a variety of reasons both from a compliance standpoint as well as just what you're truly charging uh, for items is extremely important, again, because they can affect your settlement. And we're going to look at that a little more here in slide uh, 27. A few slides ago, we compared Worksheet B, Part 1, Column 26, which are those uh, revenue-producing departments, their direct costs, plus the overhead allocations of the indirect costs, and those are reflected here, again, in, uh, on Worksheet C. And however, it's just it's flowing over on the cost report in uh, Worksheet C, Column 5. It's the exact same numbers. Now, off to the right, you see Columns 8, and that is the total charges. In the cost report, you actually have an area for your inpatient, outpatient charges, but this is the total the combined. And then on the far column to the right, or which is column nine, you have your cost to charge ratios. And this is the cost divided by the revenues, or divided into the revenues. And this gives you that cost to charge ratio for each of those individual ancillary departments. If you're a critical access hospital, this is what drives your outpatient reimbursement, as well as for inpatient, the function of your cost per day. Now there is a little bit of a different function for your routine costs, but your ancillary costs are all driven off these cost to charge ratios. And again, if I'm prospective pay, why does this matter? As I mentioned, critical access hospitals, they're getting directly reimbursed 
from this cost that uh, was found through this cost finding on worksheet C. And they're actually getting a 1% add-on, so they're getting 101% of that cost. Other types of hospitals, if you're a sole community hospital or Medicare-dependent hospital, there's a historical cost factor. It's not necessarily your cost this year, but it, it goes back uh, to a hospital-specific rate. And sole community hospitals get 100% of that difference, and MDH hospitals get 75% of that difference. And again, that's not what happened this year. If that is what was happened in prior years. And if that wasn't reported correctly then, it's impacting your reimbursement right now. Um, back to the outliers. Um, there's a variety of different kinds of outliers. There's um, uh, inpatient outliers, which are, you know, we see is derived from your length of stay, and that can be for a med surge or for an LTAC or psych or uh, rehab hospitals. And uh, you, every year a threshold is set, and if, if your cost for providing that particular care of service exceeds that threshold, then you get a reimbursement factor added on to the DRG payment. Um, that threshold, or the, your costs that are determined that exceed that threshold are directly coming from those cost to charge ratios. Same thing for um, high cost outliers. I use outpatient there, it can certainly be inpatient too. We tend to see it a lot with, um, you know, in, in my practice we deal a lot with surgical hospitals. Uh, so we see a lot of these surgical hospitals that have outpatient surgeries and are doing implants, whether it be uh, you know screws and and plates and a in an ankle or uh, a variety of different things that can cause these high costs. And again, with that being broken out, reported separately, and have its own cost to charge ratio that is accurate, it can certainly trigger a uh, a high cost outlier, and the hospital can get a little bit of money back from Medicare for providing that high cost of service. Um, I will say it's extremely important that these uh, revenues and expenses are reported appropriately and those cost to charge ratios are accurate. Um, CMS can go back in a, and audit those um, cost to charge ratios as part of an outlier audit. I got a section there at the Federal Register that kind of you know, states all that. And, um, but that can happen and uh, there's a, a very large national healthcare system that uh, I won't say their name, but it's public knowledge that they were, were not based in Tennessee, but several years ago they got in some very big trouble for the way they were, uh, I use the term manipulating um, their cost of charge ratios in order to enhance their um, outlier reimbursement. So it's not certainly something you want to take advantage of, but it is something you want to look out for to make sure it's appropriate as well as you are um, uh, getting back what is due to you. Um, now, another reason why it's very important to report these these costs appropriately and the cost to charge ratios is these are these costs are what are used to set future uh, rates. Um, Medicare compiles all this data, and they look at the costs for uh, various procedures and stays, and that's where these rates are coming from for your every year when it's updated for the DRGs and APCs. Etc. Another example is uh, new hospitals. The first two years, they get 85% of their Medicare capital costs. All that is driven through cost findings and getting proper cost to charge ratios on those capital allocations. Uh, you know, various states. We work with clients in about 40 states. Tennessee, unless you're critical access, is one of the few states that has no true Medicaid settlement. There's a lot of states out there that do for either inpatient or outpatient or both, or um, and that can and does affect the Medicaid settlement. Uh, Tricare cost reports. If you have a lot of uh, of uh, military, uh, if you're you're treating a lot of military in your area, you have to prepare a separate Tricare cost report. If you're not, you definitely need to because you get capital cost reimbursement back on that. From there, we're going to go to Medicare bad debts. <clears throat> All right. So Medicare bad debts, you know, that's a hot topic, and it's going to continue to be a hot topic. Um, um, you know, definitely with all the budgetary concerns of uh, Medicare cuts coming down, and you know, I, one of the, the recommendations from the Simpsons-Bowles Act was to reduce reimbursement to zero percent. So 
this is something that is definitely um, on, you know, everyone in Congress that got it on the mind to look at. So it's not going away. So with that, it's really important to know what what makes up an allowable Medicare bad debt. Uh, so the following slide just gives you the uh, uh, the actual. You know, there's four different criteria that, uh, uh, and we'll expand on those. What it requires to be allowable under uh, the federal regulation and the reimbursement manual. Uh, the first one is it must be related to your covered services. So if if you get a denied day uh, for a stay you can't claim that deductible on the bad debt. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, next slide. You must uh, establish reasonable collection efforts. This is where it gets a little, a little um, gray. Um, I guess it, <laughs> you know, it depends on your fiscal intermediary what the reasonable actually means. Uh, but under the guidelines, you have to use that same collection policy for all payers. So you've got to treat Medicare the same as you treat Blue Cross. And I would recommend that that's stated in your Medicare bad debt policy. Um, bill must be issued shortly after discharge. So you can't wait six months to uh, bill the patient for their uh, portion. You ha it has to be timely or else it's not considered allowable. You have to have collection letters and phone calls going out. Um, you know, generally accepted it's at least three collection letters and, you know, multiple phone calls. So. And this all has to be documented within your patient accounting system. <clears throat> One of the next rules is the 120-day rule, which we're probably all pretty familiar with. Uh, you have to wait 120 days for the date of the first bill before it can be considered reasonable collection efforts. And as I mentioned earlier, what are those collection efforts? What's reasonable? Minimum of three letters, phone calls, and the use of a collection agency. Um, one of the things that, that they note is that uh, this must be documented in the patient file. You know, typically, you know, I, when I was a CFO, I never got the collection agency's notes and incorporated myself. I just relied on the collection agency. I would recommend going forward, since it's such a hot topic, that you make sure your collection agency is actually keeping those notes. And, you know, I might even look at, you know, getting those, bringing them on site before, you know, you actually go through your bad debt audit two years after the fact. Um, make sure that's in your contract with the collection agency and that that materials are being retained. Uh, the last criteria, the bad debt must actually be uncollectible when claimed as worthless. Now, I think we all uh, came across this a few years ago when we were used to writing it off um, before we, you know, got it back from collections and they switched that up on us. This is defining that. It has to be back from a collection agency before you can write it off your AR. Um, another criteria is sound business judgment that there was no likelihood of recovery. You know, what we typically use is, you know, if they're Medicaid eligible, so, you know, obviously the Medicaid, they're indigent. It's the, you know, number one uh, way of determining that there's no likelihood of criteria. The less used method is um, determining, coming up with your own internal policy, um, determining an indigent patient. Now, what that has to be is you can't just have somebody come in the door and say, I have no money. You have to have your own policy that looks at uh, their assets, their cash on hand, uh, their expenses, monthly income, and determine based on a policy, written policy, that they meet uh, the indigent guidelines. And as always, this has to be maintained in the patient's file. As I mentioned earlier, if it, uh, the patient is dual eligible Medicaid, then it's allowable bad debt after you bill Medicaid and you get the remit denying services. Now, one thing to note that you got to be careful of, you know, let's say you didn't uh, bill Medicaid timely and it comes back denied on a timely basis, even though that they're indigent, can't claim it. The denial code has to be. Um, Denied based on um, well, what's the word it's got that it on the brain part here. <laughs> Excuse me, that the charges were less than allowable per Medicaid. It can't have a denial code uh, again that it was a timely filing issue or any other issue. <laughs> so if you if you meet all those requirements, then you don't have to wait the 120 days. You can claim it once you have that remit on file.
Now, a lot of it, this may have gone unnoticed to some, but, you know, us in this industry, you know, really took notice of this. The Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. This was signed into law the 22nd of 2012 in February and is published in the Federal Register on November 9, 2012. And what this did was it reduced uh, the reimbursement percentages for Medicare bad debts um, based on different, whatever facility. So, you know, if you're a hospital, if you're a fiscal year beginning after October 1st of 2012, it's reducing to 65 percent. If you're a SNF, they have a gradual reduction from 70 percent if you're non-dual eligible down to 65. And, you know, SNFs historically got 100 percent on full dual eligibles. Now that's going to be reduced over a three-year period to 65 percent. And the same goes for your critical assets or, um, as you can note, the ESRD or, you know, RHCs. So also within this law, uh, they repealed the bad debt moratorium. So what does that mean? So this moratorium basically prohibited CMS uh, from changing the requirements of what, uh, for example, was a reasonable collection efforts. So they couldn't tell you that, you know, they're going to switch it from 120 days to 180 days. Now for uh, cost reports beginning after 10-1-2012, uh, they can change any of those uh, determinations. So, again, as I mentioned that this is a hot topic, you can be assured that they're going to be looking at this to make it harder for us to claim allowable bad debts. Uh, recommendations. Review your current bad debt policies and make sure that, you know, you're testing them. Um, I, I'm sure that, you know, once CMS now has, you know, open reins to go back and redefine what's an allowable bad debt, they're going to be looking at everyone's policies. Um, you know, and the other thing is make sure you allocate the necessary man hours and make sure this is clean. It's easier to do it on the front end than on the back end when you're re trying to recreate the bad debt log. Uh, nobody wants to do it, you know, before May 31st if you're 12, 31 year end, trying to make sure you've got all your RA Medicaid dates on there if it's due eligible or the date of first bill. It's just easier to do it up front and make sure it's clean. The other recommendation is review your uh, collection agency policies. And what I mean by that is, as I noted, with all the reductions in the percentages, make sure you're getting all your uh, claims back, accounts back, that actually you can include in 2012. So if you're a 1231 year in, you know, contact your collection agency and make sure you've got all the accounts that they stopped collecting on in 2012 are on your bad debt list. And if you're critical access, make sure your timing of return of those bad debts you're getting them sooner than later so you can get it, you know, 100% versus 65% and on down. And with that, I'll turn that back over to Scott to talk about this important to share. All right. Uh, just briefly, I'm going to talk about DISH and kind of the key factors on this. And um, uh, just because of time's sake, we won't uh, really get the IME and GME or the uh, um, transplant, organ transplant. Um, However, just uh, real quickly on DISH, there's, there's ultimately two methods for a medical surgical hospital to get DISH. In addition, rehab hospitals uh, are eligible to receive DISH, too. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Most hospitals, um, medical surgical hospitals anyway, this is going to be all med surge hospitals excluding critical access, are eligible to receive a disproportionate share add-on to their um, uh, inpatient DRGs. This is essentially a function for the standard method, which is this 99% of the hospitals, what they utilize is uh, it's a function of your Medicare SSI days divided by the total Medicare days, plus your Medicaid, and there's a variety of other Medicaid days that can be part of this calculation divided into total days, and that gives you your Medicare disproportionate share patient percentage, or your D DPP. Important thing I want to add here is that those other days besides your traditional Medicaid that can be used here are your Medicaid HMO. If you have out-of-state Medicaid days, uh, for instance, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, a hospital may get uh, patients from Alabama or Georgia or anywhere else, particularly in a state like Tennessee that borders so many. Those out-of-state days can be reported here to help your dish reimbursement, as well as Medicaid eligible. And one thing that, that uh, 
this can be is where if you have a patient that comes in uh, through the ER and gets admitted uh, because of an auto accident. Well, the primary payer on that is going to be the auto insurance company. However, if that patient had Medicaid, even though Medicaid wasn't paying, that can be used in this function. And that is very important to not just go by what's on your census, your Medicaid census, when, when claiming your disproportionate share reimbursement, but go through and do the research or have a cons pay a consultant to go through and do that. It 99% you know, of the time, it truly pays off to do that because even one, one uh, patient added on, one discharge, can make a huge difference uh, in that. And it can be a ten, fifteen thousand dollar difference just on, on one or two patient days. Uh, the next slide, just real quick, quickly, is what the there's a the ultimate threshold to qualify for DISH, depending on the type of hospital you are, and then the formula on the right. I won't go through that. Other than I stress, if you current if your hospital currently does not qualify for disproportionate share. Do the calculation every year when you submit your cost report. CMS won't do that for you and come back and say, oh, by the way, did you realize you qualified for DISH and we're going to give you some more money? That's something you have to do on your own and see, this year, do I qualify? And if so, then you got to report it appropriately on your cost report. Um, just going through the DISH calculation, and this, uh, this is the top part of slide 41 is just your, your days, and it's a very simple uh, area here where it's your days off where she does three part one and ultimately how uh, that flows through to that uh, your uh, Medicaid portion of that percentage to give you your disproportionate share reimbursement which is reported on line 34 on worksheet E part A. Um, just real quickly, the pickle hospitals, this is the other method of um, disproportionate share, the non-standard method that most hospitals will not qualify for. This is strictly for urban hospitals, more than 100 beds, and uh, more than 30% of their revenue is really coming from other indigent, indigent sources. Um, doesn't happen very often, uh, but it does and uh, can be in large urban areas of hospitals that specialize in taking indigent patients. In that case, their dish adjustment factor is 35%, which is very high. Um, a couple changes that are coming through, and this goes back to Worksheet S10 that we talked about uh, in reporting charity care. Um, the Health Care Reform Act is reducing um, your DISH proportionate share reimbursement right off the bat, 25%. Uh, the remaining 75% is going to be pooled and allocated uh, very differently than, than how it is now as far as how hospitals are eligible. And it's truly going to be based on your uncompensated care that you're reporting. It's still very unclear on how they're exactly going to go about doing this, but it is anticipated to be a reduction in disproportionate share reimbursement of $22 billion over the next five years. And uh, just real quickly, uh, I mentioned inpatient rehab hospitals are also eligible to get a disproportionate share adjustment. This is often referred to as a LIP or a low-income patient adjustment. But the same kind of scenario, you're getting Medicare SSI percentage um, plus your Medicaid percentage gives you um, uh, a factor, and then you have a threshold, and uh, there's the calculation. And again, if you're not currently getting it uh, and you have a rehab unit or a rehab hospital, make sure that you do this test every year to see if you qualify. And slide 44 is just a sample of the, the rehab uh, worksheets in that LIP calculation. And with there, I'm just going to add real quickly on the IME and GME, just make sure um, those FTEs are reported appropriately and um, uh, everything that, that you're putting in there and those uh, worksheets for both your indirect medical education and your graduate medical education directly impacts, impacts reimbursement. And with those rolling averages, something you put in this year, it's going to affect next year and the year after and the year after that as well. It's a three-year rolling average. Um, I know we're just about out of time. Um, so on the transplants, um, I'm just going to say it's very important to have proper time studies. There's three areas you need to look at. is the pre-transplant as well as the cost for the transplant that's happening and then the post-transplant. 
And from there, we will open it up to any questions if we have time. Otherwise, our contact information is on the screen. And please feel free to call us or email us. And we appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Um, I don't have any questions that came through. Um, so like, like Scott said, if you do, feel free. Um, to email him if he gets a bunch we'll probably just put a document together and add that to the website um, we have recorded this um, so check back once again on, on that same page where you, you got the information about this and registered for this um, we will add the link to the video there in a couple of days once we've got it processed and uploaded and Scott anything else to add? Uh, no thank you very much we appreciate everyone's time for um, logging on and uh, apologize for start rushing through there at the end. All right, well, thank you. This, this was great information and we appreciate you guys taking the time to provide this education for us. No problem. We're happy to do so. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah, for fiscal year 13.